Welcome Hunters to the Horizon Zero Dawn The Board Game tutorial. Horizon Zero Dawn The Board Game is a competitive hunting game for 2-4 players, although a cooperative mode also exists for 1-4 players. To start the game, each player will need to pick a hunter. To pick a hunter, each player will need to grab all their associated cards, the appropriate model, and their skill tree tracker token. In order to set up your character, you need to place the character's card in the center of your play area. The rest of the cards will consist of equipment cards, level zero skill cards, denoted by the zero here in the top right. You can grab all those, set those aside. A skill tree card. And then upgrade cards, which are denoted by a one, two, and three. Some of these are skill cards, others are talents. But we could take this and set this off to the side. Take the equipment cards that come with your character and set them around your character so that the arcs match the placement around the character. This is your starting equipment. You can then take your skill card, place it somewhere close by, and take the skill tracker and place it all the way at the start spot at the top of the card. All those level zero cards can be shuffled and placed nearby. This is your action deck. The upgrade cards can be set off to the side as we won't need them right now. And the last step to setting up a character is to take the appropriate salvage card from the salvage deck as indicated by that hunter's ID card in the top right corner. And that is how you set up a character. After setting up a character, you need to decide which quest the hunters are going to go on. Currently, in the base game, only the Sawtooth quest exists. So we take all the cards associated with the Sawtooth here and organize them. We'll have a quarry card, which has the Sawtooth icon here in the top right and in the top left. We'll have level 3 encounters, level 2 encounters, and level 1 encounters. Separate these by their levels and then set up the deck so that the level 3 encounters are on the bottom, level 2 on top of those, and level 1 at the very top. The quarry card can be set off to the side. We'll need to set up something called the exploration area. This is done by taking that deck of cards we just created. We'll then take the event deck, which are the cards with this back, shuffle them, place them above the quarry deck. Then we'll take all the salvage mini cards here. Shuffle them and place them beside the event deck. We have a deck of stamina cards, which are all the same. You can take those, place them beside the salvage deck. We'll then have the market separated into three levels similar to our upgrade cards. So we need to sort them by their levels and place those decks beside the stamina deck here. These don't need to be shuffled right now, but they will be once we need to use them. You then take that quarry card and place it right below the level 3 salvage deck so that there are one, two, three, four spaces between the quarry deck and our quarry which means that we'll have four encounters before finally reaching our quarry and trying to take them down. The rest of the tokens, dice, enemy cards can be placed around this exploration area or whatever is most convenient for your play space. Before we begin the game proper, one player is going to need to take the fledgling token and another player is going to need to take the leader token. The game recommends giving the fledgling token to the player with the least experience with the game or the youngest player. And the opposite is true for who you give the leader token to. This token will exchange hands over the course of the game, so it's not very important who gets it at the very beginning of the game, although it will determine turn order. Once we're ready to begin, the player with the leader token will take the top three cards from the quarry deck and make a decision of which encounter he would like the party to face. 
the player with the fledgling token will take the top three cards of the event deck and choose one to modify the exploration deck. These decisions between the leader and the fledgling are made separate from each other. The players are not working together. Each is trying to make a name for themselves and stand out amongst the other players. These event cards aid in that and they usually benefit the fledgling player. Although for the first encounter card that gets selected, the fledgling will not draw from the event deck after the leader selects the encounter. He places it in the next empty spot beside the quarry deck and discards the rest. We're now ready to set up the encounter. So let's take a look at our encounter card. In the top left, it shows which quarry this encounter card is associated with. Naturally, all we have here is the Sawtooth. In the top right, we have the level of the encounter. Below that are the required number of hunt points needed for this encounter to be considered a success. In the middle, we have the board layout. In the bottom left, we have the machines that will be in this encounter. Beside that, we'll have any terrain in this encounter if applicable. And in the far right, we have the number of bonus salvage cards every player will get if each machine in this encounter is defeated. So let's set up this encounter. We have the boards 2A and 5A. We'll grab those boards and look for the badge in the corner. These boards are double-sided and they have a side for one to two players and a side for three to four players. Make sure you're on the side appropriate to the number of players in your game. Then we'll look at this encounter card. When setting up these boards, we'll set them up in the way it's depicted on the card with the badges being oriented where the dots are on this card. So here we have the 2A badge being in the bottom right corner, as well as the 5A badge being the bottom right corner from my perspective here. They go together like this, according to the card. And so those are the boards set up. Now we'll take the machines depicted and place them on their matching spawn nodes. This encounter wants to put a watcher on every A spawn node, which is this one right here, and a scrapper on every B node. Then we'll do the same for the terrain nodes. There are three types of terrain. Ruins, rocky outcroppings, or as I like to call them, vantage points, and machine corpses. Find the appropriate token for your encounter and place them in the nodes depicted on your encounter card. There are four types of terrains and three of them are tokens. Tall grass terrain is already depicted on the board. Then we'll place all of our hunters on the starting tile depicted by the large white circle. Starting with the player with the leader token, we'll take turns placing hunters onto our starting tile. Hunters can be placed in any square that is on the outside edge of that tile that don't contain any enemies. Outside edge meaning any square that is not connecting to another tile. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six eligible squares. There are no limits to how many hunters can be in one square at once. After setting up the players, make sure you've gathered the appropriate AI cards for the machines in the encounter and set them off to the side of the board. These can be face up. However, some machines have decks of cards instead of a single card for their AI behavior. If this is the case, you gather all of those cards, shuffle them, and place them face down. We don't have any in this encounter, so we don't have to worry about it. Make sure the associated stack cards are also within view. With all this set up and all of our dice and tokens off to the side, we're ready to begin the encounter. At the very beginning of an encounter, each player will draw up to their maximum hand size, which starting off at the very beginning of the game is five cards. Then, once a player's turn has begun, they can discard down any amount of cards that they'd like and draw back up to their maximum hand size. We have three different types of cards in our deck. We have ammunition, we have action cards, and 
we have interrupts. I'll explain how they're used over the course of the hunter's turn. During a hunter's turn, they can perform two actions. The first action we have is to sneak. It's a simple movement of one square in any direction, up, down, left, right, including diagonals. And the second action we have is to sprint, which is to move two squares. Same rules apply. However, if you're familiar with the Horizon Zero Dawn video game, stealth is the best approach when hunting machines. At the very beginning of the game, each machine is considered on patrol, meaning that they don't notice the hunters approach them, at least not yet. However, when a hunter sprints, if they start or enter a square that is adjacent, i.e. one square away to a machine, that machine will become alert and behave differently during the enemy phase. So sprinting is only advisable if you really need to cover distance or don't care that you're alerting the machines. The third action you can do is to distract a machine. To distract a machine, you choose a target, like this watcher over here, who is within two squares of that hunter. Then you move that machine one square towards another square within two squares of your hunter. So I could select, say, this square and have it move one square that way. There are a number of reasons why you'd want to do this, which I won't go over here. The fourth action you can perform is to craft. Over the course of the game, cards will go into your discard pile. And when you do the craft action, you take the bottom three cards from your discard pile and shuffle them back into your deck. This is important because your deck essentially acts as your health tracker. Once you run out of cards in your deck, your hunter will faint, which will push the party one step closer to defeat in this encounter. So be sure to craft when you have no other actions to perform. Crafting is also special because it's the only action you can perform twice, allowing you to return six cards from your discard pile back into your deck. The last two actions you can perform are a ranged attack and a melee attack. But before I go into that, it's also worth noting that there are some cards that may potentially give you free actions, which don't count towards your action limit and may allow you to perform certain actions more than once. Refer to the appropriate card when performing those actions. So let's talk about performing an attack. First thing we'll need is a weapon. You start off with some starting equipment, usually a ranged weapon of some sort and a melee weapon of some sort. When performing an attack, simply target a machine that is within range of your weapon in particular. The range of a weapon can be found in the bottom left corner. So here we have two squares. So our watcher here is one, two squares away. Our spear here has a range of zero, meaning that it can only be made against machines in the same square. However, when performing a melee attack, you may move one space towards your target to perform the attack. Now in this case, I still wouldn't be in range to perform that attack, so I couldn't declare this as my action. So once I declare my weapon and my target, I may add an ammunition card to that attack. However, when I'm performing a range attack, I must contribute an ammunition card. So now I've got my weapon and my ammunition. Then I may contribute one action card to this attack. Read the text on the card to see what abilities it has. It may add more dice. It may allow you to reroll dice or resolve certain other abilities. Once you've contributed whatever card you decide to contribute, total up all the dice for this attack. Then you roll it. Add up the arrows as pips, each pip being one. As you can see here, we have two pips for two, and then we have a critical. When you roll the critical symbol, you must decide what that symbol equals. So here we have our ammunition and we have our weapon. In the bottom right, we have some potential results for a critical icon. Our ammunition doesn't give us any options here, so that's out. But our weapon says, if we roll a critical, we can have that critical equal to, which we then add up with our one for a total of three, which means we'll inflict three damage onto the machine. Now, if a machine is alerted, 
we'll have to subtract the armor value of that machine from the damage we're inflicting. Here the Watcher has one armor, which is the second icon here. So this three becomes a two. But because this Watcher wasn't alert, it means we'll do our full three damage here. Once the attack is resolved, even if we inflicted no damage, we will alert the machine. They don't take too kindly to being shot at. If this machine was adjacent to another machine, they would both become alerted because machines traveling in herds notice when one of their own gets attacked in close proximity. But in this situation, it didn't happen, so the scrapper can remain unalerted for now. Performing a melee attack is exactly the same. However, you do have another option when performing an attack. Instead of attacking the machine directly as I did here, you could target a component on that machine. Now, not all machines have components, so we'll have to look at the card to see whether or not they do. Here, a watcher has no components in the bottom right corner of its data card, so there's no components to target. However, here for the scrapper, we notice that there are two components here that we could target individually. When we target a component, we resolve it exactly like we did when we targeted the main body. However, the difference is, when dealing damage to the component, you deal it to the tear value of that component. And you don't track health on a component like you do damage on a machine. Instead, it's sort of a flat comparison. For example, if we did that same attack to this scrapper instead of that watcher, that damage would instead be compared to the component we're targeting. Let's say I attack the power cell here. We do three damage to the power cell. That's not four, so we didn't destroy it. But it is at least half of that component's tear value. So while we didn't destroy it, we did damage it. We mark that a component is damaged by taking a matching damaged token and placing it beside the machine here to show that that A component is now damaged. If we did the four or more damage, we would flip it to show that it is destroyed. When a component is damaged, the next time we attempt to strike at that component, instead of comparing it to the total four, we'll compare it to half of its value. If you're paying attention, you'll notice that that means that the excess damage that we did to that component doesn't remain. We did three damage, which was more than half, but all that matters is that we did at least two. If we did one damage, because it's not at least half, we essentially did no damage to that component. If we managed to destroy a component, we'll do damage based on the number that appears beside the component. Here we'll do two damage. And that we can mark on our machine. Then, below the component's name, we'll have some extra abilities that may occur when destroying that component. Here, if we destroy the power cell, we'll disable the A attacks on this machine's behavior card. But if it's damaged, we'll get neither of those benefits. An additional benefit of destroying a component is that your precise marksmanship is rewarded with a single glory point. Glory points are what hunters use to compare themselves to others. Whoever has the most glory points by the end of the encounter will be the hunter rewarded the most victory points. Naturally, the player with the most victory points at the end of the hunt will be considered the victor if you're playing the competitive mode. A machine's health is the first number here at the top of the data card. Below that we have armor. Below that we have the number of salvage cards a player will draw for destroying this machine. Below that we have a number of glory points that will be earned for destroying this machine. And below that, we have the number of hunt points this machine is worth. Now, hunt points are what we need to consider this encounter a success. If we look back at our encounter card, for this encounter, for this encounter, for one to two players, we'll need a minimum of two hunt points to consider this encounter a success, which means we need to kill this scrapper. The watcher in this encounter is only worth one hunt point. 
So if we only kill the watcher and allow the scrapper to escape, this scenario will be considered a failure because we did not accrue enough hunt points. If you defeat a machine by dealing the amount of necessary damage or more, naturally we'll discard it and the player who dealt the killing blow will earn glory points equal to the number shown on the card and they'll be allowed to draw a number of cards on the salvage deck indicated by that card's salvage value. There are two types of salvage cards. We have proper salvage, which are resources which we'll use during the market step, which we'll get to later. And then we have fake cards. These are resolved when you draw them. And once they're resolved, they'll get shuffled back into the salvage deck immediately. Be sure you draw your salvage cards first as they might modify how many glory points a player earns for this kill. But these cards can also be used to trigger abilities on certain cards. So use them wisely. So let's rewind and say you went with our first attack here against the Watcher. Now the Watcher is alert, the Scrapper is not, the Hunter's turn ends. The cards that they contributed to the attack get discarded and after a single Hunter activates, all the machines will then activate before we proceed to the next Hunter. During the machine phase, alert machines will activate first and then non-alert machines. But we also have to determine whether or not a machine becomes alert. A machine will become alert after an attack is resolved against it, like we did here, even if that attack did no damage. If a machine at any point suffers damage because of a trap or another ability, it becomes alert once that ability is resolved. If an alert enemy happens to be in the same square as a non-alert enemy, then they both will become alert. Or as I mentioned, if an enemy is attacked beside a non-alert enemy. After the attack is resolved, the attacked enemy will become alert and then the adjacent enemy will also become alert. If at the start of the enemy phase, the machine's in the same square as a hunter, they become alert. Or if they're adjacent to a hunter at the start of the enemy phase, they become alert unless that hunter is hiding in tall grass. In this example here, if we have a watcher who is not alert, adjacent to some hunters who are hiding in tall grass, he won't become alert because he can't find them. The scrapper here is an exception because it has an ability that expressly allows it to ignore tall grass. And so in this scenario, it would become alert. And as I mentioned, if a hunter performs a sprint action adjacent to an enemy or moves adjacent to an enemy during that sprint, they become alert. But enough about that. How does an alert enemy activate? When an enemy is alert and activate, we look at their behavior card. And we go from top to bottom, resolving each step. There will be some conditionals that appear on there. And it'll ask you a question. Is there a non-alert enemy within two squares? We look at the board and there is. We say yes. Then we'll move one towards the closest non-alert enemy. Otherwise, if it was no, we move one towards the closest hunter. Now we'll notice here that there are different backgrounds beside each of these actions. We have this blue background, which denotes that these actions are conditional. A conditional action means that we'll perform one or the other, but not both, or multiple if there are. If the first action can be resolved, we resolve that. If that is otherwise impossible, we'll then resolve the next action in order. However, if the actions do not have a blue background, it means each of these actions are mandatory and must be performed in order. Normally because this watcher is not in the same square as the scrapper, it wouldn't become alert if we remember our laundry list of alert conditionals. However, the watcher here says, while this enemy is alert, any non-alert enemies in an adjacent square become alert at the end of its activation. Enemies alerted in this way do not activate this turn, which means we would alert this scrapper and then finish the enemy phase here. However, let's pretend that this watcher was, say, one step further away and that its movement brought it here for whatever reason. Our scrapper would remain unalerted. And so, when it is its turn to activate, 
we don't use the behavior card because it's not alerted. Instead, what we do is we look at the path that it started on and we'll have it follow that path going in the direction of the arrows here. So we simply take it and we move it one space along its path. This can cause it to eventually go off the board. And if that's the case, the machine has fled the encounter, which means hunters will not get any rewards for slaying it and the amount of hunt points available in the scenario has been reduced. Now let's say I distracted this scrapper so that it moved in this direction. It's on a new path, but it's not its original path. And so when it activates, if it's still unalerted, it will attempt to go back to its path and farther along its path. So in this case, it'll go back into this square and in subsequent turns, we'll continue down its path. So what happens when a machine attacks a player? There are three types of attacks. We have melee attacks, ranged attacks, and pulse attacks, which aren't depicted here. These will have a range, which is the top number, and a flat damage value, which is the bottom number. When machines perform a melee attack, they attack a hunter within range, prioritizing the hunter who last activated. When a machine performs a range attack, they target the closest hunter, prioritizing the last hunter who activated. When machines perform pulse attacks, they attack every hunter in range. And so when a hunter defends, they will have to attempt to dodge the attack. When a hunter dodges, the first thing that they do is move to one adjacent square, up, down, left, right, diagonal, because they're attempting to roll out of the way. This doesn't cost anything and is simply in addition to the dodge roll. When you dodge, you'll use the armor that you're equipped with and any modifiers that you can find amongst the action cards in your hand. Tally up all the dice, just like we did when we attacked, and subtract your value from the attacker's value, suffering the difference, unless you negate all of the damage. When a hunter suffers damage, they'll have to discard cards from their hand or from the top of their deck. They're allowed to pick any combination between the two, placing those cards in the discard pile. If they have no cards in their hand and no cards in their deck and they suffer damage, then they will faint. To show this, you simply take your hunter and place them on their side. When that hunter activates next, they'll skip their turn entirely, which means the enemies also will not activate. Instead, that hunter spends their turn reshuffling their discard pile back into their deck and drawing a new hand. If a number of hunters faint equal to the number of hunters in the game, then the scenario is considered a failure. So in this game here with two hunters, if two hunters faint, even if it's the same hunter twice, it means both hunters will fail the scenario. After shuffling their deck and redrawing their hand, the next time that hunter activates, they'll stand back up and activate as normal. Naturally, enemies will completely ignore any hunters that have fainted, as they're not eligible as a target until they stand back up. After the enemies activate, there is a maintenance step that happens before the next hunter activates, which is where the players will determine whether or not they want to continue the scenario or end it right here. You would have to end it if, as I mentioned, too many hunters have fainted during the scenario, or you may want to end it early to secure the safety of your hunters, or all the machines have been successfully hunted, or too many machines have escaped and there is not enough to fulfill the hunt requirements of the scenario. If it's no longer possible to achieve that hunt value, the hunt ends immediately, even if there are still machines on the board. But if it's still possible to win, the players can choose to continue, and then the next hunter will activate and perform their actions. With the basics out of the way, let's talk a little bit about terrain. Here we have ruins. Ruins are essentially a line of defense. When an attack is happening against a hunter that is in a ruins token, instead of dodging, you instead simply remove the ruin token. And that's it. It is a free block for a hunter. We then have the rocky outcropping, which I call the vantage point. If a hunter performs a melee or a range attack while on the vantage point, they will earn one additional point of glory if they kill a machine or successfully destroy a component. 
And keep in mind, when you perform a melee attack, you may move one square towards your target, but that means that the attack is then not resolved on the vantage point itself. We also have the machine corpse, which if you're in a square with a machine corpse, you may spend an action to salvage it. When you do, you'll draw three salvage cards from the salvage deck and remove the token. We can also get into some more complicated concepts like the concept of trap weapons. Here we have a trap weapon. It's a trip caster. Here, this icon denotes that this is a trap weapon. Here is some trap ammo, also showing that it is a trap. Here, instead of targeting a machine, we target a square within range. When we target the square, we place a trap token on the square and then a trap token on our trap to show that this is associated with that one. This is important because we might find other types of trap ammunition that have different effects. But here we're saying that trap is a firewire. Then once an enemy, for whatever reason, steps onto the trap, they trigger it. And that is when the attack is resolved. Following whatever modifiers we show amongst the cards contributed to the placement of the trap. Once it's resolved, we can then discard the tokens and the ammunition used. Some attacks can apply status ailments onto their target and they behave differently when applied to hunters and machines. When applied to hunters, fire will cause that player to suffer one damage at the end of their activation and then you discard the token. A player suffering from the freeze condition must discard any criticals when attempting a dodge. After you attempt a dodge, you remove the token. Lastly, we have shock, which means that a player cannot play interrupt cards while they have the shock token. At the end of the turn, they may then discard the token. When an enemy suffers from fire, they suffer a damage at the end of their activation. When an enemy suffers from freeze, the next time a hunter attacks them, you ignore their armor value, even if they are alerted. Lastly, an enemy suffering from shock is stunned, and when they activate, they simply discard the shock token and end their activation. After an encounter is over, if the hunter has defeated all the machines that started on the board, then each player will take bonus salvage according to the bonus salvage number on the scenario card. We can then clean up the rest of the board here and move on to the campfire phase. We determine which player will earn a number of victory points depending on the number of players. We do this by tallying up the number of glory points those hunters have achieved over the course of the scenario. In a two-player game, the player with the most glory tokens will receive a full sun token, which counts as two victory points at the end of the game. They will also receive the leader token. In a two-player game, the other player will then only receive the fledgling token. The glory tokens are then discarded. In a case of a tie, neither player receives a sun token, and instead the players will swap leader and fledgling tokens. In a three-player game, the player with the most glory points receives a full sun token and the leader token. The player in second place receives a half sun token and the player in last place receives the fledgling token. In a four player game, the player in first place gets the blazing sun token, which is worth three victory points and the leader token. The player in second place gets a full sun, the player in third place gets a half sun and the player in fourth gets the fledgling token. In a case of a tie of a three to four player game, the players will receive the token that is a step down for the place they're tying for. For example, if two players are tied for second place, the player in second place would normally get the full sun, but instead both players will get a half sun. And they will count as having being in second and third place. If there is a tie for first place, it passes to the player who doesn't currently have it. If they both currently don't have the token, the first player in turn order will receive the leader token. If there is a tie for last place, it passes to the player who doesn't currently have it, and if neither player currently has it, then it goes to the player who is first in the turn order. After passing around all those tokens, we then determine if the hunters have leveled up. We look at the scenario that we've completed. This here is a level one scenario, and we look at our skill tree and we determine where our hunters are currently at. The hunters start at level zero. 
and we've just completed a level 1 scenario, and 1 is better than 0, and therefore they will level up, and the players will have a choice on their card to get some new upgrades. And this is where we get to look at the upgrade cards we set aside before. We can get new equipment, new skill cards, and new talents. Talent cards offer new abilities, and they don't go into your action deck. You can tell that they don't because they have a different back. These simply get placed underneath your player card and offer a new ability. Equipment cards will naturally take the place of any equipment you currently have, and any equipment you currently have gets discarded from the game entirely. Some upgrades allow you to add new action cards into your deck, and if that's the case, you'll take all those matching cards and shuffle them into your deck. Another benefit of leveling up is that the number of cards in your deck increases, which effectively means your health increases. If the upgrade you choose doesn't give you new action cards to go into your deck, you have an opportunity to add new cards into it, and we do that by going into the market step. Now, if the encounter that the hunters have finished is the same level that they are currently at, they do not level up. So here's how the market step works. We take the deck associated to the level that we just completed. Seeing as we just completed level 1 encounter, we get the level 1 deck. We shuffle this up, and then we take cards from the top until we have a shop that consists of two modifications, two pieces of ammo, one weapon, one piece of armor, and one miscellaneous equipment. Discarding and redrawing for any cards that go over the limit, I just explained. So here we have our two ammo, here we have our two modifications. We have an extra modification, we'll discard that, redraw, and keep doing that until we get our weapon and our miscellaneous piece of equipment. Now for some reason, the deck runs out of cards, you'll reshuffle the discard into the deck, and if you still run out of cards, then that shop is sold out for that piece of equipment. But once you have all the cards, this is now our shop. And starting with the leader and going clockwise around the table, each player will have an opportunity to buy something from the shop. The cost of an item is in the top right corner. So the salvage cards that the players accumulated over the course of the scenario can be spent to purchase this equipment. Now modifications can be added onto a weapon or a piece of armor. We have coils which go onto weapons and weaves which go onto armor. Each piece of equipment has a number of modification slots which show how many mods can go into that piece of equipment. Now when you give a piece of equipment a modification, it's not permanent and can be swapped in and out at any time when you're not in a scenario. But a piece of equipment cannot have two modifications that have the exact same name. Here we have a resist melee weave and in other markets, we might find a better version of this, which comes in blue or purple. If that's the case, we couldn't have those two, even though they are different cards, because they share the same name, they cannot go onto the same piece of equipment. But they modify your weapon and armor with better stats or new abilities. When you spend salvage cards, they are one-to-one -one for what appears on the card. Here, this shows that this can be one scrap, and one salvage of any choice. But you can have two pieces of metal scrap count as one piece of any of the other special resources. And you can have one of the special resources count as one piece of metal scrap. It's also worth noting that if you happen to have modifications that you no longer want, these can count for one piece of metal scrap. When a purchase is made, that player will take the card, replace it with anything that they currently have, discard the replacement, and then draw a new card from the deck to replace the one that they purchased. Then the next player in line will get to make a purchase. They may choose to pass, but if every player passes, the market closes. When the fledgling makes their first purchase, they may purchase any piece of equipment on the board for free. It's the perks for being the underdog and you might choose to pass so that hopefully other players in line will buy something from the shop and then replace them 
with something that you want to purchase. Once every player has passed and the shop closes, you then go back to the hunt phase. It's worth noting that ammunition cards go into a player's deck while the other pieces of equipment stay out in front of the player. When adding cards into a player's deck that are in excess of that player's deck limit, they must take cards from their deck and discard them. And if at the end of the merchant step, you find that you have not enough cards in your deck to fulfill your new limit, you may then take as many stamina cards as necessary to fill out your deck until you hit your limit. These can naturally be taken out later when you purchase new cards. And those are the basics. The only other thing worth mentioning is that when you are hunting the quarry, which is always the last scenario during your hunt, your quarry in particular is also worth a half sun for killing it, which means it may give you an opportunity to jump ahead on the leaderboards for getting the last hit on the quarry. Also, if the hunters manage to fail the quarry scenario, they fail the entire hunt. But once this is successfully completed, the players will then tally up their victory points. Each blazing sun being three points, each full sun being two points, and each half sun being one point. Whoever has the most points is the most renowned hunter and the victor for this hunt. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please like and subscribe to support the future release of more tutorials like this. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. I've supported the Horizon Zero Dawn board game on Kickstarter and will be getting all the future content it has to offer. So keep an eye here if you want to see more Horizon Zero Dawn content in the future. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching.